So the ratio of the circumference to the radius that the ant think is the radius would be 2 pi r by <coughs> r theta, right? That is L. Okay. Yeah. So you see that this is not pi, a uh, 2 pi. This is 2 pi into sin theta by theta. However, when it is when theta is very small, that is, you are close to a tangent, then this vanishes. That is a very important thing, okay, in general relativity. I actually, so I should have spent probably more. So, but then that means uh, that my the surface I'm considering mm -hmm. is uh, curved or straight will depend uh, will depend on like how far I go from my needle. That is right. Then like that, yes. That is actually true. So, okay, let me spend a little more time on general relativity. I, of course, uh, was trying to skip to gravitational uh, waves, but let me say a little more, give you some more examples, okay? So, let's say you can take, a, take an elevator, uh, which is, so let us, let's say this is the earth, okay? And an elevator, is falling on the earth, okay? And there are two objects here and there is like one person who is observing these two balls, okay? And this elevator is freely falling. So what would this person see? Balls suspended in space. Freely falling, right? Stationary. And there will be no force between them because there will be uh, they will maintain their distance. Mm. So if the person is calculating the force between these two balls, the person mm. will say zero. Zero ball, zero force. Mm. So is it true for the whole path? For the person it goes no. to the radius of the so it goes to the center of the uh, that is right. Even though for a small distance it will appear as if there is no force mm. when you When, when it travels for a little more distance, then you see that they are actually coming a bit more close. Okay? The person will then think that there is a force between these two objects. <coughs> Even though that is not exactly created by these test masses because they can be very small. But this is the effect of curvature. Because these balls are falling, uh, their, their trajectory was not parallel, that effect is created. So it does depend on the extent, uh, uh, I mean the, the size. So when you are looking, you are limited in a very small portion of space time and you are in the right coordinate system. Now in normal space, a coordinate system means, uh, you know, spherical polar, these that you can think of that, that way. But when you are considering space time, a coordinate system means a frame. For example, the lift which is falling is a coordinate system. If lift is which is stationary, everything, if all other special coordinates being the same, it is still another coordinate system. Okay, and this you will see in uh, special relativity. You will often see, like <coughs> for example, you have seen this before actually in Galilean relativity already. That let's say uh, this is time, this is space, and then you take another frame which is where. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, okay, let us call it, if we cannot call it T prime, okay, let's, this is the problem, people often, uh, this is X prime, and this is T, okay, time is T prime, so, and then this, this frame would be moving with respect to this, but when you are considering space time, see these two are actually two different coordinate systems, right? Even on this plot, there are two different coordinate systems. Okay. All right. So, so what Einstein's theory basically says is that uh, that I told you that about this curvature thing that matter, uh, 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 mass and energy creates curvature, and curvature tells how this is to move and so on. But then, if you conduct, so we also had special relativity, which is valid for. Uh, in inertial frames, 
Now and then, we know that none of the frames are actually inertial because there is the earth, we are here, we are performing experiments. Then how come we get any consistent physical loss? Because all the time we are performing experiments in an environment where there is gravity. The thing is that if you perform an experiment where the <coughs> curvature is low and uh, you do not uh, put the particles too far away, you do not wait for too long and things like that. That means you are basically restricting yourself to a region which is small in space time, much smaller than the curvature of space time at, at that point. Then you will, you are essentially, you can choose a frame which is, uh, which is inertial. That means in a freely falling frame. Okay. So what is the effect of curvature here? So let's say that uh, this effect of curvature that two balls will start coming close uh, will happen after some long time, right? For the earth. If there was a black hole instead here, then that effect would come much ar earlier. That means as soon as it moved like maybe few meters, you will see that effect. So that, that's what it means. On the earth, basically the effect of gravity is much very small, the curv effect of curvature. So all the experiments we do are essentially in, in some sense in an environment which, which has uh, very low uh, uh, gravity. All right. Now, uh, okay. Uh, I think I have, according to the schedule, I have 10 minutes and I did not even start talking about gravity well. <coughs> but then we will go up to maybe maybe half an hour more at least. Okay? And then I tell you a little more about gravitational waves. Because this way, whatever I said will give you some idea about f flavors of general relativity. But it is not going to be a, I mean, it has to be taught in a more rigorous way. So, and this slide actually is a very nice, it's transiting to that, so it's, it's okay. okay. So this equation, which describes gravity in a more general way than Newton's laws, in the low, uh, uh, in the low curvature limit, you can derive, the new, derive Newton's laws from this equation. In fact, that is how you fix these constants, by comparing with Newton's laws, because that is how, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the point was that I mean the way the theory was developed was that at low frequency I mean wh whatever we measure for example how the planet is moving around the uh, around the sun and so on so those things all we already knew we knew Kepler's laws and that is how the constants were fixed basically to get match it to our uh, real life observations. Now whenever I am saying that the gravity is weak it means that there is a small component of gravity still there curvature so basically what is done is that there is something called the metric, okay, which tells you what is the distance between two points in space time. In space, of course, we know how to measure the distance. So, for example, if this metric is like a uh, ruler, okay. You, when you see uh, the, that there is one object at, let's say, that mark one, and another object at mark, let's say, four, then you know the distance between them is three in the units of that ruler, right? Now. Basically, in some ways, <coughs> gravity fixes that unit. Okay, how? What would be the light travel time delay from one point to another point is is uh, sort of determined by this uh, quantity, the metric. Uh, and in uh, uh, when the gravity is weak, that means we are not very close to a black hole. This can be written in terms of this Minkowski metric in the suitable coordinate system, of course. You can always choose a very weird coordinate system where things will go, uh, cannot be written like this. But you can always choose a coordinate system where you can write it like the Minkowski metric, which is a diagonal uh, metric. I mean, you will see it's, it's basically a matrix which has uh, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes minus 1, no, plus no, 1, plus no. 1, plus 1. And then plus some small perturbations. Okay? That means small fluctuations which are, which are, which have some effect. But the numbers are much smaller compared to 1. So it could be 10 to the minus 21 or something. Whereas this quantity, it was almost diagonal with the absolute values 1. Now, when you put this in this, you can get a wave equation. Okay? You, have, you will get this in electrodynamics. Okay? 
that uh, this kind of wave equations you will see. And then when you are in vacuum, that means there is a source which has generated something and you are starting that field in the vacuum, this right hand side becomes zero. And then you get an equation which is of this form that box h mu nu equal to zero. Okay? So this this equation you have seen probably mm -hmm. is a standard wave equation which you solve to get the velocity of sound and things like that, right? I mean th this you have seen. So this is basically that uh, del squared, del x squared plus this uh, something <coughs> divided by c squared, that is the velocity of that wave, minus del squared, uh, del t squared equal to uh, zero. Uh, c is with the other 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 term, sorry, so this is multiplied by c squared. Okay. All right. Now, when you solve this equation, you know that this this form of the equation that if suppose this part was zero, always has the solution, which is a function of omega t minus k z, where k is equal to uh, uh, k is equal to two pi by lambda, okay, and lambda is uh, c by f, and omega is two pi f, okay, and when you put off, so. Basically, these two things are related. Omega by k is c. Omega by k is c. Yes, omega by k is c. Right. <laughs> that is right. Because basically, you want to. This is of the form c t minus z. Okay. So this is a propagating wave. So that solution you can get from. Uh, I mean, you will get a solution like that, and you will see that if you choose the coordinate system properly, then there are only two independent terms in this matrix. Only two. H plus and H cross. Okay, so which basically means that gravitational waves have only two polarizations, right? Yeah. So this is all about gravitational wave uh, theory that we are going to cover in the in, in this form, and now we will slowly get into the astronomy part that what we can do with gravitational waves. Okay. So but okay, so some some properties of gravitational waves basically these are transverse waves. That means the you know what transverse waves are that if you take a uh, the ribbon and then move it like this. The wave will be propagating in this direction, but the uh, but so the disturbance is in the orthogonal direction, like electromagnetic wave. Okay, they travel at the speed of light. That comes from the equation before. That this box operator, the term which is the velocity term, is actually the velocity of light. It has two polarization states. Now the thing is that they interact very weakly with matter. Okay. This is because gravity is a very weak force. Now, uh, what is the uh, is, is is it a bad thing or a good thing? Now, first, the, it, it is a very good thing. Of course, it makes it very difficult for us to detect gravitational waves. Okay, the when a black hole, the, the detection which happened when two black holes merged a billion uh, light years uh, away, the effect of that on the earth was that such that uh, a ruler which is 4 kilometers long had the length changed by less than the size of a proton okay this was that small but so it it, it was a really challenging thing to detect such a small uh, vibration okay but then why are we saying that it's a good thing it's a good thing because it can it can travel through very dense medium. Okay. Suppose there is a there is something going on in the center of the galaxy. It is believed that most of the galaxies have a supermassive black hole at the center. And let's say a small black hole is going around it and finally falling inside. Okay. But the the if you seen if you have seen the pictures of galaxies, there is the central part there is a bulge. It's extremely dusty. Nothing can be seen inside, right? But since gravitational waves interact very weakly with matter, gravitational waves can come through, pass through. Similarly, if you uh, if you know the the earliest picture of the universe that we have, you know what is that? The cosmic microwave background. So why that is the earliest picture? Uh, because at that time the universe was already 3.8 lakh years old, 380,000 years old. So that is like pretty late, right? But before that, what was happening is that since photons interact strongly with uh, electrons and uh, protons, they 
they were uh, electrons let's say so they were uh, being scattered all the time okay so i can see you because light travels straight from you to my eyes but if suppose i put some smoke here i would not be able to see you because th there will be too many too many scatterings right so uh, so what happens there is that uh, in the early universe when the universe was very dense the atoms were uh, ionized they were like free electrons and protons so they were interacting very strongly with uh, with the photon so photon could not travel straight to us it was doing all sorts of this kind of motion so the medium was very opaque but then universe expanded the temperature fell and then the protons was were uh, could capture the electrons because their velocity the, if the temperature goes down the velocities were weak, uh, smaller then they could be captured and at that point they made neutral hydrogen and the interaction with uh, uh, photons went down and then the photons could travel uh, freely to us okay so that happened when the universe was 380000 years old okay now if we want to see the universe <coughs> before that actually we want to see the first second after the universe was born there are only two ways one is gravitational waves the other is neutrinos okay so that is why this is so this is a good thing because if gravitational waves and neutrinos also interacted with matter we would not there would not be any chance probably to see the universe's earliest moment of course it will still take a lot of time you are in the right moment right now that the astronomy started and then we have all these things to explore uh, and it may not happen before at least i return but then it may happen before <laughs> you retire so that is the thing okay so anyway so there is lot of huge effort is going on to develop jupiter to astronomy now we have a detection but then we have to develop the astronomy part of course this is not going to work yeah so okay i think i have told you about all these curvature fluctuations and so on so what to okay, let me say a little more one more thing that i said that gravitational waves basically change the ruler okay between two points so the distance changes another way to see it is basically the curvature fluctuation that what actually it does is that generally it is flat okay when you are far away in the weak gravity the uh, the space time is flat so if you had a triangle the sum of the angles would be 180 degree but then uh, uh, when gravitational waves fall that it basically fluctuates from positive to negative curvature and you can basically construct diagrams like this let's say you start from the north pole and you take um, 0 degree east and let's say 90 degree east draw two <coughs> lines they will meet the equator at 90 degrees and then you close it you will see you have created a triangle whose angles are all 90 degrees mm -hmm. that means a 270 degree angle because it is a positive curvature surface and similarly when there is a satellite surface that you can have negative curvature where the total angle would be less than uh, 180 degrees Thing like that. So, but uh, this is of course different in the. This is for two dimension, but this is how uh, what uh, happens when gravitational waves fall on uh, an object. So, in practice, uh, uh, what happens is that um, I think I will skip some slides and show you. Uh, so, this I have sort of explained. There are so many things to sort of talk about. See, this is the problem. Okay, let me just uh, go to this part. So the one animation generally is good. So this is, I think, this will be the last thing I talk about gravity wave uh, signals, and then we we'll go to the detection mode. So what happens is that when two compact objects go around, they emit gravitational waves. They lose energy. To compensate for that loss, they have to come a bit close, okay? And then when they are closer, their period reduces, like the smaller, the closer planet to the sun have smaller period hence they move their frequency increases they emit gravitational waves at a faster <coughs> rate okay and this is like an a avalanche process the closer they are they emit more gravitational waves and then they finally collide and merge to form a bigger black hole this is the this is what was detected so uh, yeah and there was uh, one uh, so in radio this is a radio astronomy school so i have to tell you this that is right so the first indirect detection of gravitational waves happened when hulls and teller 
observed a binary pulsar uh, for many many years. Actually, this was uh, I don't know I don't remember how long he Hulls and Taylor observed. Do you know? 20 how long? Years. 20 years. But Hulls observed it for two years and then it was taken and then he shifted to plasma physics and then I think. Uh, ah, that Weisberg, that I know, that these then, people, yeah, yeah, Weisberg. 30 years, uh, this is this plot is the 1975-2005. Yeah, but it they was discovered by Hulse. 22 years. Yeah. 22 years. 22 years. It was discussed in one of the previous talks. Uh, yeah. 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 It's still been observed, I think it will... Uh, no, no, that is true. I mean, what I am saying is that when, what time they, they concluded... The first that, announcement was made in 1978 at the Munich, uh, I think, relativity... Oh, so that is in two years, after two years. Yeah, after three, yeah. After two, three years, yeah. So... So this was observed for 30 years and this is how, uh, so what is plotted <coughs> here is basically the uh, shift in perihelion, but, but basically this is the measure of curvature, okay, that, uh, or the, how the, not curvature, how they are losing gravitational wave energy. So if you knew the, just the energy part, not the phase, that how much energy they are losing per unit time, if that is known, then they are perihelion, that means they are, that orbits will shift in a certain way and this is plotted here, okay, that uh, these black dots are basically the observed values and this uh, solid line is what is predicted from general relativity. That means if you can predict the loss that is happening, energy loss that is, that is uh, predicted by general theory of relativity, that is through gravitational waves, then you get such a nice match and that, that, is, that was the first indirect detection of gravitational waves and they got a Nobel Prize for that. <coughs> Okay. There are other possibilities of indirect detection, for example through CMB and so on, that where you see the effect of gravitational wave some, on some another body and then observe that. And of course, see I am saying that term indirect many times, but then here people may get annoyed because SKA uh, may be able to detect gravitational waves and may even be able to localize the sources on the sky. So there also you are sort of seeing the effect of gravitational waves on uh, uh, on other bodies and then trying to come up with a conclusion. Other bodies in the sense that the waves which are emitted by uh, pulsars will be slightly uh, modified by, because of gravitational waves. And then by doing a cross correlation between, because this there is often a lot of noise, but the effect of gravitational waves will be coherent. So by doing a cross correlation, you will be able to find the source. Yes. Sir, uh, in the media there was a lot of jargon about symmetries and all that stuff. Symmetries of? So symmetries uh, are everywhere. No, I mean of the particular symmetries that are required for uh, detection of gravitational waves. The gravitational waves would not be emitted by when the motion is too symmetric. For example, if there is a ball which is expanding and uh, like doing a radial motion, there will be no gravitational wave emitted. This is th can be proved theoretically. Uh, so, gravitational waves are emitted only when there is a certain asymmetry which can be, to the leading order, it can be described by the quadruple moment, okay? So the mass quadruple moment, if, it is, if there is a varying mass quadruple moment, then gravitational waves are emitted. Okay, so now the direct detection. Okay, I am, like, this is, I am supposed to end the lecture now and I am starting the detection part now. <laughs> so, the thing is that, if when gravitational waves fall on a ring of particles like this, it basically deforms it, keep, keep, keeping the area uh, constant. So basically, if we had a Michelson interferometer, okay, place like this, that there is a mirror here, there is a mirror here, there is a beam splitter here, a light is coming here. Oh, how many people here know about uh, gravitation, uh, about Michelson interferometer? Oh, excellent. Okay, so then you know that there will be, uh, if the arms are equal, then you will have a probably a bright fringe here mm -hmm. uh, because both have the same number of uh, reflections uh, from rear medium and then uh, but then you can always set it to a darker fringe and then if this path length starts oscillating with time then there will be a phase change here okay you can uh, or to compensate for that you may try to hold this test change the position of the test method slightly so that the fringe stays the same. So this will give you the uh, gravitational wave signal. This is how you measure gravitational wave. Okay. I mean basically this is what is going to happen. This will create a path uh, fringe shift on this detector and then uh, uh, but you try to basically don't allow the fringe shift to happen but you feed it back so that the arms are changed slightly to mm -hmm. account for that.
Okay. And this was the first uh, detector, which was basically even if you had a one one bar, you could see the uh, vibrations, right? Because if there will be some change, and then if you have very sensitive detectors which could read off that signal without perturbing the bar, perturbing the bar itself, then you would be able to detect it. So this kind of detectors, this is basically a very heavy metal aluminium uh, bar of some 200 kilos or something. So it's done by Joe Weber in Maryland, in, uh, I think third, like in 1960s, 70s. So what happens when gravitational wave fall in this is that it rings like a bell, okay, like in a in a temple and things like that. But it's a very narrow band, so it's it, it, it is you can there is a resonance frequency of this bar, so only in that band you would be able to see something. So that so it is not a very good detector and also it does not see all the directions. There are efforts going on to make a cryogenic detector which can see in many different directions and so on, but the uh, hopes I don't know how uh, promising the effect is. This is Michelson interferometer and I already explained, since you know Michelson interferometer, you don't need this diagram. You basically uh, would be able to, uh, if you want, you can find it online. Okay, so <coughs> basically there are many detectors uh, in the world uh, which are being built right now, but two, I mean three operated um, uh, with, uh, with sort of desired sensitivity. So two are LIGO 4 kilometer detectors in the US one in um, uh, Hanford, another in Louisiana. Brett is, uh, works very close to this detect. Uh, no, he's in Stanford, not exactly there, but I think it's so still closer. Close. Yeah, it's just, uh, he's here. So whole, <laughs> as compared to the world, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, then uh, the other detector which worked was a Geo 600 meter uh, detector. It's a sort of prototype detector lot of technology development happens here, it is in uh, Germany. <coughs> then uh, Vargo detector also uh, worked and then now it is being upgraded to an advanced configuration when which basically in increases the detection of gravitational waves to a finite level. All these detectors are in uh, advanced, uh, the LIGO detectors are in advanced configuration now and a detector, 3 kilometer detector is being built in Japan. It, this is with cryogenically cooled. See, you see that mirrors, there are this thermal motion in the mirror, right, in, at room temperature. Because we are trying to detect a very small signal, these fluctuations also matter. Of course, one can average over area and time and things like that, but then if you can cool it down, then those fluctuations will be low. So they are trying, uh, uh, they are basically trying to reduce the temperature of those mirror to uh, reduce Brownian motion. And then there is uh, the plan for a detector in India. I will come to that uh, in little. Uh, so, so there are more things about the detectors I could uh, talk about. For example, even if you see, if you, uh, I said that gravitational create a very small disturbance on the ruler. Longer the ruler, more the fluctuation. This is because it creates a strain signal, like an elastic strain. Okay, so the delta L by L, that is the fluctuation in the length divided by L, the fractional length change, is of the order of 10 to the minus 21 cell. So you want a longer detector to increase del delta L, right? More delta L, uh, more the L, uh, higher the delta L. Now, so you choose a 4 kilometer detector. LIGO detectors are 4 kilometer long because it is very impractical to have like a 100 kilometer detector on the earth because you need flat surface, the mirrors have to be aligned if you go too far away, like in that diagram, mirrors would not be aligned anymore. Okay, so it will be a problematic thing. Now, the thing is that, but that is still not enough. So what you could do to uh, to increase path length is to put mirror and put the lasers go like this. Okay, but that would be a, not a very good design. So what is done instead is that all so a febrifugal cavity is created within the arms. Okay. So light effectively bounces back few hundred times in this and then, but even then you want even more power. So basically one after other resonance cavities are built. See Fabrico is a resonant cavity, you know like there is a resonance condition under which the power goes up and so on. Uh, you have to keep the arm length as a multiples of. How do we control when it reflects and when it goes through? <coughs> I mean no, it is always doing, we're doing the same thing, huh? all the time. The power is built and that is there. When okay. gravitational waves come, okay. they try to uh, 
change the power, actually mm. reduce the power. Mm. But then you don't allow that bus train signal, which is proportional to delta L by L. So, which is equal to delta L by L. So, you want to increase L in order to get a uh, larger delta L. Yeah. So, with 4 kilometer detector, the fluctuation is less than the size of a proton. So, you can imagine that if it is small, the probably it will be smaller than the size of any particle. Yeah. So, there are many noise sources for these detectors. At the lower frequencies, the noise comes from seismic vibrations. So, since we are trying to detect very small things, any uh, somebody jumping in the uh, control room would can create a lot of noise, right? And there are many things, for example, seismic waves, uh, people driving to work, and all those things create a lot of noise. So, so this is done. So, so with that because of that, the detectors have to be first of all the site has to be chosen such that it is a sort of quiet site. Then you have to put a lot of vibration isolation system. Okay. So that means if you take Let's say that you had a pendulum, okay, and then you move it, okay, and it will move like that, right? I mean, some with some uh, characteristic uh, uh, frequency. Now, let's say you are holding it like this, and then you uh, start moving it very slowly. You will see that the pendulum is moving with your hand, right? Mm. Now you start moving it very fast like this. You will mm -hmm. see that the motion is much smaller. So the thing is that if you have a pendulum, a suspended pendulum, it uh, filters out the higher frequency fluctuations. So LIGO basically employs a multi-stage uh, uh, pendulum system, like four stages, so that the uh, noise at higher frequencies due to seismic vibrations are deduced. Okay, but then that is not enough because when you want to do higher and higher configuration, you have to look into very minute details of many things, and Brett is an expert on that. So. So basically there are a lot of details and you have to really get into the details to understand that every small noise and so on which we are talking about. At the higher frequencies it is the, the noise is dominated by uh, sh uh, photon short noise okay and it basically this is the readout noise which uh, comes in the in your for example in your, your digital camera. So at night when you are taking a picture it gets blurred. It is because you need a certain number of photons to get the proper signal to noise but at night since this number of photons is less, in order to build that, it has to integrate for a longer time, so your hand can shake uh, during that period, so it is sort of like that. And the central part is dominated by thermal noise, because of this Brownian motion and so on, which, which create uh, 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 noise here. So basically, what the, the aim in almost in each of these is to create, see you cannot basically get rid of noise completely, you can reduce it, and then you create uh, a situation uh, or choose the configuration in such a way that most of the noise is concentrated in frequencies which are far away from your band of interest okay so you want a very high quality factor a very narrow uh, picked uh, I, uh, you know about quality factor how many people know about quality factor here? you have done uh, forced harmonic oscillator right so you see that in a forced harmonic oscillator there are depending on the quality factor if the damping is more <coughs> the curve which you see would be like more broader if the damping is lower then it gets more sharper and sharper so you want <coughs> such situation that where it is sharper and then all the power goes in that frequency and then the other parts are cleaner okay so uh, so this is how a typical LIGO noise curve looks like so this is the frequency and this is noise that is the amount of uh, fluctuation that happens even when there is no gravity wave signal. That means you cannot detect any gravitational wave signal, let us say in a, in a given frequency band unless it exceeds that, okay. Or it could be little low but it has to be integrable. That means when you integrate for a longer time like uh, with a digital from, uh, camera at night, then you can increase that uh, uh, sensitivity. Okay, and then there is a lot of activity regarding the data analysis because you have to extract that signal from no matter what happens, the signal is going to be noisy. <coughs> of course, the first black hole which we detected, plus, uh, first black hole binary, the signal was so strong that it was almost visible by the eye in two detectors which were separated by 3000 kilometers. So there was hardly any uh, uh, trouble in detecting them. 
but still in general when the signal should not be that strong and it becomes a bit complicated to detect. So for example like let's say there is a signal here, you know, we know the shape of the signal, okay, that whose amplitude and frequency both are increasing with time. It's called the chirp signal because birds chirp like this. And let's say it is embedded in this uh, blue colored noise. So of course by uh, you cannot see it visually that way. But suppose somebody told you they gave you this shape in terms of some parameters. Okay. Then what you can do, you can first put the signal here and do a correl cross correlation with this data. And you will get some value. Generally you will get a random fluctuation. Okay. But when the, the signal which is there in the data matches the signal which you are uh, that that is called the template you are correlating with, then you will get a peak. And this will look like uh, this. So let's say that you are putting this signal and correlating and plotting it here. As soon as it matches there, you will see we will get a peak. Okay. If the peak is above the uh, above the noise level, significantly above the noise level, you can claim a detection. But then such things can happen also because of several environmental effects. Mm -hmm. So you cannot be confident about this. So there are basically 1.5 lakh monitoring channels in LIGO which are always looking for this environmental effects. So from this you can basically throw away some of these. And this is happening in two detectors. But if the same thing is seen in both two detectors at the same time, then you know that most likely this is going to be a gravity wave signal. Of course, you can never say with 100% confidence. You can only assign some confidence level. What level of significance do you know this? That for the that detection that has happened, the probability of the, that signal uh, being a random noise yeah. is 1 in 200,000 years, I think. So the probability yeah. is that low. Mm -hmm. See, you can always convert it in terms of uh, time, right? This, yeah. Uh, this, yeah. So the false alarm probability is like that. So, so it is like really, really uh, less likely that it is from something else. <laughs> So I think I will skip this part. So right now, on all you can look at is this: the probability that when the see detectors are, have still not reached its goal sensitivity, it is still far away. So when it reaches the target sensitivity, <coughs> if it can <coughs> ever reaches, uh, in the same way, because generally what happens is that people design something and then you get something else which could be better or worse in different bands. Then you typically expect one detection per week. Okay, that is the expectation, even though there is a big error bar. So this is like how many you detect in uh, per year and for neutron star, neutron star this will be 40, for black hole, black hole it is 20 and things like that. But then yeah, there are, anyway let us skip through some of the things. So I think I think I will just, so for example yeah this was one of the plots which was made by one of my students, so which was, uh, yes. But how big the black holes are as compared to different Indian cities so when they march. So this is, these are the typical black holes which, uh, I mean that, that's the one which were detected of, or of this size. They found this. Uh, even though they look a bit sm small, the masses were 30 times the solar masses. And mass of the earth is a very tiny fraction of the sun. So you can imagine that how massive these things are. And they were moving at the velocity, uh, at half the velocity of light when they march. And this is the signal which was detected in the two detectors. Okay? And as you can see, of course, there is a lot of filtering has been done, but nothing too uh, specific about the signal in this plot. And then if you fit some uh, templates, that is expected signal, then you sort of get like this. And the residual, when you subtract out the signal, is very low. That means it is consistent with the noise. And this is what was seen in a time frequency plot in the detector. So you see that this was what was seen. And now I think the last five minutes I will spend on LIGO India. Okay. So one thing that I am not get uh, maybe here. I am not getting into this uh, uh, the whole science business. But you see that the main point is that this is just the beginning. This is the first detection. There is a whole lot of things to do. We still don't know how the black holes formed in the universe exactly. I mean there are different models. We don't know where they are because we have very poor angular resolution right now. Uh, we don't know uh, how many such black holes are there in the universe. What we detected is just a statistical flu or most of the black holes which are there in the universe are uh, very massive. 
and all these questions have to be answered and that will require many many detection and like was second observing us so that first so the detectors were turned on and we started seeing something and now the second one is running for uh, has started running so we'll see what we see there and then there are several important challenges in astronomy and cosmology which have to be addressed by this so for example like you know uh, I started by saying special relativity so if Einstein accepted that Newton's law is the thing and then we don't do anything then of course science would have stopped there we would not get uh, the effect of special relativity that all the nuclear uh, reactors and things like that uh, so now we have to challenge general relativity because we have seen that it is consistent but we have to find out when, where it fails it is very hard to believe I mean it may be that general relativity never fails but then we have to see that does it remain valid at very strong gravity and so on so those things can be probed by uh, as the number of observations increase there are many other sources of gravitational waves and I actually work on something related to the stochastic background which could be created in the early universe or in the nearby uh, this thing. See, if, when we see any source in electromagnetic astronomy, they are actually stochastic. Okay, there is no phase information which is coming in. But I, I did, do not have time to talk about that. But what I want to show you is this. So this is the in, th these are the maps of the universe in different frequencies. Okay, and we want to do the same thing for gravitational waves. We are just here, and we have a, not even a map. We have like one detection here right now. So there is a whole lot of things to do, I mean, which uh, you can probably do. See, we, in, in terms of the detectors, we are basically here. This is like Galileo's telescope. And in 400 years, electromagnetic astronomy has evolved so much. We have, see, from here, to all these things are like, <coughs> like all technological marvels. So again, for gravitational waves, we are basically, the, the, this whole path has to be covered. Okay, so and then a lot of plannings are going on. So this is the schematic of the Einstein telescope. So this will be underground with a 10 kilometer uh, arm and forming a triangle and so on. And this, these are not just a diagram. People have done uh, a full survey across Europe for to find a site. A seismic survey was conducted. Then there was the space based detectors which were also planned. See, in the, on the Earth there is this seismic noise which you cannot isolate. But in space, no one can hear you scream. No. So, so that reduces all this low frequency noise and then you can have a big arm length interferometer uh, and things like that. So I mean I am just showing you some glimpse and then the pathfinder mission for to which is a precursor to the previous uh, to that to this mission had enormous success. It's, uh, so hopefully the, the mission which is called LISA the space mission we also fly and then there are many other observatories which are being proposed to see that earliest moment of that universe okay so now the final thing about LIGO India so we need a network for different reasons first the detectors are not working uh, all the time uh, most of the time I mean so they, they are working for let's say 80 percent of the time so you want a whole network across the world so that the sky is always observed discovered uniformly because all the de detectors do not see the sky in the same way okay so some there are holes and so on but i think the most important would be to find where these events are happening you know right now we had only two detectors and this is the error circle on the sky for the uh, black hole black hole merger event this is actually huge you can fit some 2000 moons in this so just to give you some idea but if LIGO India was operating when the detection happened the error circle would be this small okay. if, so this would give some realistic chance for the other observatories electromagnetic observatories to look at that point and then see they see also something so this is like this this is the reason why this is so big is like you know these GPS satellites if you have, if you have only two you can only uh, uh, localize an object on a ring on the sky and this is essentially a ring, but since the detectors are not uh, 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 are blind in certain directions, this part is cut. But as otherwise, it is basically the ring which is which you are seeing. But if we have another detector, then we can pinpoint it in a much uh, more precise way. So adding LIGO India to this existing LIGO network 
would not only like I mean, first of all there is like there are two detectors right now. Okay, Vargo may come up. When LIGO India comes up, there will be three extra baselines. So the number of baselines will be doubled. See, right now the baseline is, uh, I mean, after Vargo comes up, the baseline will be Hanford Livingston, Hanford Vargo, Livingston Vargo, three. So when LIGO India comes up, there will be three more baselines. And each one will be longer than the, uh, or not each one, maybe this one is a bit small, but these two would be much longer than the existing one. So it will be a very important uh, uh, detector. So many times people say that, oh, will the LIGO India detector be as important as the US detector? The thing is that, then I, my answer is that, assuming that all the detectors are working with the same similar sensitivity, uh, if, suppose one of the detectors goes off, how much sky coverage you lose, if you calculate that, the LIGO, if the LIGO India is off, then you lose maximum amount of sky that way. So it will be one of the most important detectors if we can make it uh, working. Okay, so there are many other things. Let us not get into all this. The Prime Minister approved it and this the MOU was signed. The detector basically is in principle funded. So now, and then the reason why India uh, administrators are so excited is not just the astronomy part, but this gives the, the these detectors connect several aspects. For example, there are different fields of astronomy which will be connected and the theoretical areas, but then there are all sorts of engineering areas where people would be able to do cutting edge science, okay, in a collaborative way. So that develops different kinds of, I mean, the whole technology in the country. And so after LIGO India people, the trained people would be able to build other detectors in the country, right? So that was the, and also you may, uh, you may uh, open your own companies and become billionaires. That is another possibility. <laughs> so you cannot rule out such trivial thing. So anyway, so the summary is that Galileo's telescope brought a renaissance in astronomy and <laughs> gravitational waves we also uh, do the same. Okay, really out of time. So, I mean, I was out of time half an hour ago. So now it is, <laughs> I think we stop here. All right, questions? <laughs> because this is the reflex action, yeah. So, if, if we can actually detect two black holes, which are very weak sources, then mm -hmm. certainly, like let's say, two galaxies merging should be very easily detected, right? So the, they are, the frequency <coughs> is very low. Frequency is very, very low. Two galaxies are going, um, the speed, uh, the frequency at which they are going around each other is comparable to the age of the universe. So, the, so basically, the frequency is 10 to the minus 15 hertz or something. So with these detectors, it is difficult. That is Prof Professor Parchi from NCRA, well, I think he calculated the frequency for bullet cluster, which might heard. I think it's 10 to the minus 22 hertz. That is the thing, yeah. So we, act, yeah, we, uh, we had looked at it. I mean, my PhD student first problem is data was to see. I mean, just to start our problem was with the with black, black with the dark matters and so on. I mean, you know, you take a potential well. Uh, I don't know if you know about these potential wells in the this thing, and then you make some dark matters move and see how much is. I mean, but these are very. I would not say it will never be detected, but there is very. Really, I mean, it is in a very different frequency band. The so chances are low. But now, what he is, he Bakshi is check, uh, uh, looking into are the collisions of clusters, yeah, yeah. which can have more uh, effect. Yeah. What <coughs> So when Einstein gave his general theory of relativity, after like 20 years or so, uh, there were a whole lot of expedition to see the starlight bending, so right. which confirmed general relativity. But the, the media nowadays like uh, has a propaganda like Einstein's uh, theory is confirmed now after 100 years. So what what is so special about this thing? Uh, like it also confirmed general relativity uh, many years. Right, back. right. So so there are different uh, aspects to it. So here, what you are seeing, see ge general relativity, uh, if you take a low uh, 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 gravity approximation, it gives you Newtonian's uh, theory, right? Then you go to little more further, and then you get this bending of light and so on. Now, when we want to see, I mean, and then the actual effect, the curvature is, when the curvature is really strong, the normal Newtonian approximation do not work anymore. 
we want to see how the, uh, Einstein's theory uh, works when when you go to that high energy or high curvature regime. This is the first time we saw a black hole with when it is merging. So that means both are really, really close. We did detect black holes earlier, again indirectly, when the stars were going around it. But at that point also, you can use just Newton's law to predict the mass of the black hole. I mean, there is no hardly any effect of the uh, the, uh, the curvature. I mean, there is an effect of curvature, but it is not as strong as that the whole perihelion is moving and things like that. I mean, things are there. It's like slow. But with this, two black holes are really merging. Okay, that has like a really high energy effect, and that uh, basically uh, sets the platform when we can start challenging Einstein's theory and see when it fails. Sir, yeah. uh, I had sometime back read about some uh, very old detector of gravitational waves where they employed uh, the the expansion and contraction creates some heating effect. Uh, and then measure the heat that is... Oh, that is a thought experiment. That is a thought experiment. It is, I think... How exactly can it create a heating? Ah, because gravitational waves uh, carry energy. So I think if you are talking about this, uh, uh, the rod and on One which you put... One of the very first detectors. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so I think the detector I know of, about this, that it's a thought experiment basically. You take a rod, you put do beads on that rod, okay? And then when gravitational waves fall on that, See, this rod is rigid, it cannot move because the force of the molecular forces are much stronger than gravity. So it would basically stay like that. But these beads are sort of free masses, not completely free because they are acted by frictional forces. So they will keep on moving, they will generate some heat in this detector. And then you argue that who are from where the heat is coming. <coughs> that means the gravitation... as well, I mean, won't they move together? Why would there be friction? No, no, there is a rod and then you put two rings let's say on the rod. Hmm. So the rings will move right because they are free. So when gravitational waves are coming they are creating tidal force okay. like oh, differential okay. force. Hmm. So they are going to move. The rod cannot move but this can, the, uh, these rings can. So they will uh, create friction, I mean it's some heat energy right. So the argument was that from where the heat energy is coming <coughs> it has to be from gravitational waves. So, but was it, would it be feasible given the internal energy of the particles of the rings themselves, would it be even compared to? Uh, it will be very small. That is why I am saying that this is not detectable, but it is a thought experiment, which said that how the, you create this heat energy from gravitational waves. Okay. I think, I mean, I, I overshot time by like a large margin. <laughs> so, we, I think we stop here and we can see if there is, so the, I think the next lecture is at 45, okay, so we have 10 minutes, so I mean if there is tea or something then we can